In Tijuana, the cartels try to kill you four times. In Juarez, twice. Five times. Five times. In Juarez, twice. How are you staying alive and doing all this? Conocía los riesgos a que me enfrentaba en Tijuana y los riesgos a los que me enfrento aquí. Yo no puedo ni hacerme el, el, el pobre o el sentirme lastimado, no por eso. Julián Lizaola Pérez is a very macho police chief who wants to fight his enemies directly in the streets. And he will call them out by name and he will threaten to attack them, to even kill them. The Juarez police chief says Mexican federal agents shot at him. Al voltear completo, había un grupo como entre 10 y 15 tendidos en el piso, todos todos disparando hacia mi camioneta. Por eso, pero no le tiré. Oye, pues ya mataron a uno. Ya mataron. Policía es símbolo de corrupción. Hablar de policía es hablar de corrupción. The Chapo Guzman offered you eighty thousand dollars a week when you were the police chief in Tijuana. Nunca voy a, a poder trabajar con un delincuente. Nunca voy a poder hacer. Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Leon Blevins, professor of government at El Paso Community College. This is late February of 2016. I have a guest today that I've had on several times during the years. I've been doing this program since 2007. And uh, over that period of time, the person I've interviewed the most is the one that is here today. In fact, I've interviewed him so many times, I told him I feel that he's a part of our staff. At one point, he was New Yorker. Now he is an El Pasoan, and he spends a lot of time with us at El Paso Community College Television. Welcome, Charlie Mann. Welcome again. <laughs> hey, Leon, how are you? I'm <laughs> doing well. Yeah. Uh, Charlie is a movie maker, and he makes a lot of movies about um, El Paso area and Mexico. He has a new movie out called Mexico's Bravest Man. I might say that Charlie Mann is El Paso's bravest man because of the amount of time he spends in Mexico in various dangerous situations making documentaries. Charlie, tell us about your latest documentary. This is a passion project for me. Uh, Julian Lazio Lopez, as I've been studying for five years now, pretty mm -hmm. intensely. He came into Ciudad Juarez in March of 2011 when the city was at its worst point in terms of violence. Uh, 2010, Juarez had suffered through 3,111 murders, which was a record for the city. Mm. Uh, eight murders a day. Uh, I came out with a movie called Eight Murders a Day, which I talked about on your show. Right. Uh, played in 30 U.S. cities, came out in 2011 to uh, create awareness. So Laziola comes in uh, with, a, with an extremely controversial reputation from Tijuana as someone who cracks down on the cartels, uh, f uh, perhaps tortures his own police force, fires them, uh, rules with a no-nonsense, uh, just a no-nonsense approach. So he comes into Juarez with this big reputation, and by the time he leaves two and a half years later, the murder rate goes from 3,111 a year to 490 a year. So that's about an 80% dip. I'm not saying he deserves 100% of that credit mm -hmm. of that dip, but certainly he's a part of it. Okay. Now, you had heard about him when he was Tijuana before he came to Juarez, right? Yeah, he was the police chief in Tijuana. So you knew about his reputation there. Yeah. And didn't you fear from the very beginning that he would be killed? He'd be assassinated by the cartels? Well, they tried to kill him five times in Tijuana, and the Organized crime was unsuccessful, mm -hmm. so I knew attempts would be made in Juarez. It's just a matter of him staying alive, and he was able to, uh, as police chief in Juarez, uh, avoided two desperate situations where gunshots were fired towards him. Mm -hmm. uh, the second attempt in Juarez was really a big one at the Cerezo prison right outside. Uh, the federal police fired at his vehicle, and little did they know that the vehicle that he was in was bulletproof, or that would have killed him. Um, I think the federal police was trying to kill him for two and a half years, they just couldn't find that right moment. I think they thought the Sedoso incident was that incident, but they came up short. And then the eighth attempt overall for his life came when he was not police chief last May of 2015, and that was the first time he was actually struck by a bullet, left paralyzed from the waist down, uh, which is where he's at today in a wheelchair. Now he's gone back to Tijuana running for mayor. Right. But you have interviewed him. Tell us about your interview with him. How, how about that? How did you work that out and how did it go? Well, I had interviewed him for The New Juarez, uh, my third film in, in Mexico mm -hmm. that completed my trilogy in Juarez. So he was aware of me, uh, but it was still hard to get a hold of him because 
there really was no way to reach him because he wasn't police chief anymore. Mm -hmm. But I just threw my connections, through my producer, we just kept digging, digging, and digging. And finally, it was Thanksgiving week, he contacted my producer. My producer contacts me late. Uh, I remember I was in New York. Um, she calls me, it's Monday before Thanksgiving. We were interviewing him the day after Thanksgiving, right by the San Diego Tijuana border. Uh, the interview that you asked about was deep, in depth, complex. Uh, a lot of the tough questions were asked. I'm not hailing him as a hero in this movie. I'm exploring both sides, whether he was a hero, villain, good guy, bad guy, innocent or corrupt, or all of the above. Mm -hmm. Now this is near the opening of this particular film. And it's going to be at what location? Where well, it, it opens to... uh, February 26th uh, at Bassett. So it's, uh, this weekend is, is playing now for anyone watching. It's going to run for at least a week. Okay, out of your assistants and others that have helped you on watching this, how do they rate it? How do they feel about it? Are you going the right direction in interviewing about this and seeing the changes in Mexico? Well, I've only really had, outside of my editor, uh, one of my assistants watched just a couple of clips. That's uh -huh. it. Uh -huh. uh, the film is literally, um, was finished a couple of days before the film had to be turned in. Uh -huh. So uh, th th I would say the film is fair, balanced, objective, uh, dangerous. I mean, you're talking about being the police chief in Juarez in Tijuana. This is not like folding clothes at the Sierra Vista Mall. Right. Uh, this is a very serious topic. Life and death. Every move this this guy, his decision every day, just from where to eat to where to go, life and death. Now you've been going to classes at UT El Paso and El Paso Community College, including some of my high schools too and high schools. Mm -hmm. What about the feedback from them? Do you expect that very many of them really are interested enough to go see the film? I think so. It's all really how I present it. But I will say this, Leon, surprisingly, a lot of people don't know who this man is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you really want to know about what's going on in the, in the Juarez uh, situation, the, the violence there, you'd have to watch Cuarenta Cuatro, Channel 44 in, in Juarez, or watch Univision, or Telemundo, or Azteca America, Televisa, uh, read Oi, PM, Diario. Um, I, I, I always encourage the El Paso media to cover the Juarez violence more because it's only 300 feet from here and you and I see how many people are affected by the Juarez violence. Now thank God it's gone down a lot in the last year or two. Good job by Omar Munoz who's the current police chief in Juarez. Uh, he gets no credit it seems like. I hardly ever hear his name. Maybe no news is good news. Some of my students are watching some of your videos including some of my other videos that are on YouTube now. And uh, some of them have watched uh, videos that you have produced, such as your update of the massacre in Las Cruces, okay? And some about uh, what's been happening in Mexico. And one of the young women in her report, when she turned it in, I noticed her question was this, why does Mr. Men like to make movies about such horrible things? Well, answer, uh, answer her question. Uh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, uh, it's all how you look at it. I I'm here to represent innocent people who have been murdered. Um, I'm all about justice, getting justice for people who cannot fight anymore. Uh, you know, I'm around a lot of victims, friends and families who have been devastated. Mm -hmm. So it, it's all how you look at it. Uh, my films represent, um, like I said, innocent victims who have been murdered. Uh, the five themes that my films encompass are uh, violence, uh, crime, humanity, guts, and heroism. So those are the five themes that I follow. And uh, yeah, it's bad, but uh, we can't pretend it's not happening around us. Right. I mean, these events are important, they're significant. Um, we, we have to address them. They're not gonna go away if we don't address it. Someone has to speak up for these people, and if it's me, then so be it. Another one of the students in the report, of some of the videos you've done, complimented you on the fact that you were giving some money you make from showing the films to some organizations that assist with some of these, such as with the young people in the southern part of Mexico, a whole village of them kidnapped and The 43 students. The 43 right. students. Right. And complimented you on that fact. Are you still able to do that? Do you make enough you're still able to help? No, some absolutely. I'm in a position now, I mean, when I first met you, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, six years later, 20 films later, um, I'm lucky. I feel like I'm in a good position now to help people. You know, back then people were calling me cheap, but I was, my career was just starting out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally didn't have it. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, I literally switched careers. So 20 films later, six years later, I'm in a good position now. Now, you go to several cities to show your, your films. Where do you find some of the best responses? Oh, here, it's not even close. Oh, it's El Paso? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. this is my home. This is, this is my heart's here. I okay, mean, but you show it in Odessa? Odessa's good too. 
Uh, I would say that's second. Okay. West Texas has been really good to me. LA's been good. Uh, Tucson's starting to come up a little bit. And, uh, but I'm starting to now focus more on certain cities and not like eight murders a day played in 30 U.S. cities. That was a, a, an exhausting grind. <laughs> uh, SF Chapel played in 20. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm getting higher up in the uh, ladder here, I'm able to find distribution quicker, uh, deal with companies that can put it right on Amazon, right on Hulu. And that's the fastest way to reach people. Okay. Now, Chapo Guzman, you did a film about him. Uh, have, and having escaped, and now he's been captured again. And the question is whether he will actually be extradited to the United States. Only time will we'll tell on that. But in doing these films about him, what about Laziola's relationship to Chapo Guzman? Didn't Guzman try to bribe him? 80000 a week, yeah. 80,000 yeah. dollars, pesos, or what? Yeah, 80,000 80, pesos. Pesos, yeah. a week. A week, if which is just, a lot for a, a policeman. If he would back off. Well, if he would, well, I guess, yeah, if he would allow the Sinaloa cartel to do business um, and not be um, interfered with, if you will. Now, the cartels are famous for silver and lead. You either take the silver or right. you receive the lead. Or plata plomo. Or you will do, we will do terrible things to you and your family. Mm -hmm. and, and what did he say to you about that? How, did, did he t had you heard about that before? Well, he, he, didn't, did? he didn't take the bribe. I know he didn't take the bribe, right. but had you heard of that before you interviewed him? You mean that term, Plata the, Promo? Yeah, no, no, that they had actually approached him with that. Oh, no, well, when I researched Lazy Ol over the last five years, I, I read about that probably a year into my research mm -hmm. about his controversial tenure in, in Tijuana. A lot of things happened to him there. As a matter of fact, so many things that happened to him in Tijuana also happened to him in Juarez, which proves that you can change the city, but you can't change the person. I mean, he, the same exact things happened to him in Juarez that he did in happened to him in Tijuana. They, they tried to assassinate him multiple times. He fired a bunch of police officers. Uh, he was accused of torturing his own police force. Uh, I mean, this man has been dogged by allegations of human rights abuse, torture, and even murder. But a Mexican cop being accused of this, Leon, is nothing new. Okay. I mean, you mentioned Mexico police. What's the first word you think of? Mm -hmm. Corruption. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So he, this, he was in a no-win situation. And it's unfair to the honest Juarez police, uh, Tijuana police, who have this label the stereotype of right away, oh, because I'm a Mexican policeman, I must be corrupt. That's not true. There's certainly some corrupt officers in right. there. I couldn't give you a, an exact percentage of... Oh, no. Nobody can. Right. But I did ask Lazy Ol in the film, so I'll save that for the movie. All the tough questions were asked. Mm -hmm. Now, as you traveled around in Mexico in, in these recent months, did you get a sense that things really are getting better and that people are getting where they trust their government more? Or are they still just as skeptical as when you first started doing films there? It depends on what part of Mexico you're talking about. Okay. Uh, in Juarez, they're down to 308 murders. That was 2015. So mm -hmm. that's less than one per day. Mm -hmm. That's the lowest total since 2007. The nightclubs are packed. The streets are filled. I think Juarez is back. But with that said, I meet a lot of El Pasoans who say they'll never go back. You know, nunca jamas. Oh, oh yeah, never no, go no, back. Right. Juarez was traumatized for so many years that it's going to take time for the process to heal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of El Pasoans, even though they have family there, they refuse to go back because of the risk of something bad happening. Now, just last week, the Pope appeared just across the river from us, just across the border from us, Pope Francis. Have you sensed um, he's playing on the theme of mercy and hope? Right. Have you heard any of that ripple here in El Paso and Juarez? The fact that the Pope came and maybe that would be helpful? You mean to what is you mean? To Juarez. It's coming to Juarez. Well, I, I, I think, um, you know, obviously Pope Francis wasn't around in 2011. I would oh, have no. liked to have seen that happen back in 2011 right. or even 10. But the city has already been repairing itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'll give you a great example. Enrique Serrano, the mayor of Juarez, the former mayor of Juarez now, actually, he just left, okay. uh, was upset at the movie Sicario because Sicario depicted Juarez in the worst light. And that this was, was an American-made film, right? A year ago, right, right okay. by Lionsgate, okay. who, who brought The Nightmare in Las Cruces. Right. And he was threatening to sue the producers of Sicario because the movie depicted Juarez to look like the worst place on earth. Mm -hmm. And Serrano's point is that we have come back. You know, we're averaging less than one murder a day. Why are you inaccurately doing this and making our city look like something that they're not? Right. So the repair has started. It started when Laziola left. The city was down at less than 500 murders for the year in 2013, and then 14, 15, it just kept getting lower and lower. Do you think he's going to come here, maybe? Who? For the film, Laziola? 
Well, that's a that's a, a long story. I, You've invited him out. Oh, so. plenty of times. I told you know the whole thing would have been taken care of him, his bodyguards, his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have paid for all that and put him up in a hotel. Okay. But he sh he, he the doctors told him not to travel because he's paralyzed, right. and he has to do intense physical therapy. Oh, okay. Well, that would be good to visit with him. Do you anticipate going and seeing him again after the film is out? Yeah. Well, his campaign manager called me and said, "Can you please bring the film to Tijuana?" Uh -huh. So San Diego, Tijuana, sure, I love San Diego. Okay. And I like Tijuana too. Tijuana is a very interesting city. Oh yeah. Uh, I knew Tijuana it was much more peaceful as a young teenager when my father lived in the Los Angeles area. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was an exciting place to mm -hmm. go and visit. Mm -hmm. a place, a good place to go eat. And so. Absolutely. Well, what about um, your relationship here now on the border and what you're looking at for future films? Well, 49 babies killed in Hermosillo. I showed that in your class, the okay, trailer. A trailer, that's yeah. already finished? No, we're going to start editing that literally this week because we have to wrap up this film. Okay. So, uh, The Mexico's Bravest Man. Okay. So, the 49 Angels will, we haven't even gotten all the transcripts yet because the whole movie was, all the interviews were done in Spanish, so we have to get that translated to English. Oh, okay. But that, that's a story that I wish the Pope would have recognized. He didn't. Uh, someone should have told him about that case. I mean, if we had 49 babies, Leon massacred, uh, well, killed in a fire. Right. In Hermosillo, a suspicious fire that was set by a, what I believe was a government official from Sonora to destroy paperwork. Uh, unfortunately, the fire, the fire spread, and I'm not sure if the fire was meant to kill the babies. It was certainly meant to kill the paperwork. Now some people are telling me that maybe the government did order that uh, for the babies to be killed to divert attention away from the drug war, which was really escalating big time in 2009. Is that believable? Uh, you know, Leon, I polled some classes at EPCC, and you wouldn't believe how many hands went up. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. I know. I mean, if that was done on purpose, then it's time to give up on the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so much tragedy. Well, what, what about the government officials? In an upcoming interview, I'm going to be interviewing a consulate official from Mexico that's stationed here in El Paso. And we see demonstrators outside his office. He might not like me bringing this up on your show, but he works for Mexico. Some of the officials that you've met, you trust, you believe, right? Not every well, official in Mexico. I didn't say Mexico. that, but I mean, I take everything, I, I take it in, let's put it to you that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you assume that what they're saying is true until you're able to find that it's not? Or do you approach this from the other side? You believe it's not true until you can prove it's true. You mean in the case of the, uh, the fire being yes, meant to kill the babies? Yes, any of these kind of things that you're hearing about, uh, when can it reach? I know in Mexico their legal system is based on that fact, that you're guilty until you prove you're innocent. This is a real tough one, Leon. I mean, I'd like to believe that the paperwork um, was the only intended target here, but it is Mexico and their own people call their own government murderers. Mm -hmm. I've been to a lot of these protests mm -hmm. in Mexico City, the 43 students, right. there was probably more rallies for that than anything. And they're calling the, the government murderers. Yeah, there were some outside and, the Mexican consulate oh, office here Enrique in Enrique Peña Nieto, uh, Felipe Calderon, they've been called murderers, mm -hmm. literally by their people. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, I mean, let's say the government did order it. I don't think we'll ever hear that from anyone or mm -hmm. someone's going to admit that. Mm -hmm. But certainly the people are, are suspicious. I mean, that alone is disturbing. And one of the greatest losses in any of this is the loss of trust. Who do you trust? Well, that's been thrown out the window decades ago. Yeah. I mean, the officials in Mexico and the authorities, I mean, I would argue that the police might be the biggest problem in Mexico. I mean, people in Juarez tell me that I'm not afraid of the cartels, I'm afraid of the police. Well, weren't a bunch of these that were shooting at him, federal police? Well, I mean, that's a sore spot. I mean, everyone knows the federal police and the federal army came into Juarez and murdered the whole city. I mean, and then when they left, the violence went down. <laughs> There's yeah. the proof in the pudding. Yeah, well, I've had other uh, people on this program that took the same position, that there was so much corruption and violence and loss of trust, that how do you rebuild a society unless you start getting some trust back in the police, in the courts, in the people that are elected to office, even the electoral system itself? Well, I mean, you really want the big answer here? The, the <laughs> Mexican people tell me? What? A revolution. Some say that's the only way that you yeah. can clean up a yeah, revolution. Yeah, I would say more than just some. A lot. Yes. I mean, it's gotten that bad. Oh, oh my goodness. We're talking about 140,000 dead Mexicans since 2008. The only country worse than that is Syria at a quarter of a million. And we probably have more that have come over to, from Mexico to El Paso in the midst of all this and the largest number since the revolution of 1910. Well, El, Juarez's loss was El Paso's gain. It's a, it's a bad way to gain um, 
I mean, the city gained a lot of money, El Paso, because the Juarezans fled. Mm -hmm. It's a tough way to have your economy go up because of the reason of the Juarez tragedy, but that's what happened. Yeah, and I've met some people that fled Mexico, and they even came to community college and got specialized skill training and are now living in El Paso, making money and paying taxes. Well, they came here for a new life. Uh, good for them. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully they've, uh, they like El Paso. I love El Paso. This is a great city to to live and to have a job and be happy. Okay. Uh, what about other police officials that you've met that you find might be interesting to do a movie about? Other police officials? Mm -hmm. Over in Mexico. Well, you know, I tell you, I don't know how many lazy olas there are uh, south of the border. He's it, huh? Well, I mean, as far as I'm aware of, at least to do a movie on, uh -huh. I mean, the current police chief in Juarez, Omar Munoz, is sort of a very quiet, low profile guy. Mm -hmm. I don't think he'll give you that incredible sound bite that. Laziola gives all the time. I mean, the words coming out of this man's mouth is, is um, this man has enormous guts. And that's the reason you say he's Mexico's bravest man. Because guts is a big thing with me, Leon. I always talk <laughs> about that. It's the most beautiful part of a human being. It beats superficial good looks any day of the week. Uh, if you have guts, people will respect you. Well, don't you think some of the Marines that actually took down Chapo Guzman just recently had guts? Of course. To go into those sewers and, and not just take the money and go out the other end and say bye. Right. But they actually went in there and were being shot at and they were shooting back. It was like a, a warfare. Well, the Marines also got him in Mazatlan in February of 2014. That was what my movie's about. Uh -huh. you know? Well, my movie was more about whether it was really him or not, but mar the Marines went to his condominium and, and got him there. So it's the, it's the, who is the leader over the Marines in Mexico? Wouldn't you say that that person might have to have some degree of lack of corruption, an honest person giving direction to the Marines to go in there it's and do it? It's very murky, uh, Leon. Um, who's clean, who's dirty, who's kind of in, kind of out. I, uh -huh. I mean, it's uh, what makes this so, what makes this a puzzle is that you don't know who's really honest, who's really corrupt. So you have to always be on guard, no matter what side of the law you're on. Yeah. Because you, you don't know who the person next to you is. And you don't have the connections that can find all that out or the money available to try to find all that out. Like I know you said, a, I, it's murky, it's murky. <laughs> I know a lot, but not everything, Leon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then, what, what are you looking at next then for your next adventure, besides the, the children that were killed? Yeah, well, You've there's got, a lot of things on my plate. Uh, the Sandy Hook Project in Connecticut, mm -hmm. uh, the, the 20 babies that were murdered. Okay. Uh, not babies, excuse me, first graders. First graders. Yeah, mm -hmm. six, year, six years old. That's practically a baby. Right. You know, the, the McDonald's massacre in San Diego is starting to come back and haunt me now because that happened in 1984. And uh, I've had people tell me not to make that project and no one would care. And I, I want to respectfully disagree with that. But that was I, I think people would care about that. It just depends on how it's framed and how I talk to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not convinced that people are not going to care about that, even though it was 32 years ago. And that was a much smaller number of people killed than. Oh, that was a lot, actually. Uh, <laughs> there was a man who walked into a McDonald's in San Ysidro, right by the Tijuana-San right. Diego border, right. on the USA side, right. opened fire. He was firing for 77 minutes, 77 minutes. He went in there, he did not like Mexican people because he had had a bad experience in Tijuana a year before. Mm -hmm. His name was James Huberty. He okay. walks into a McDonald's, fires for 77 minutes. Someone calls 911. The police go to the wrong McDonald's. So this guy's firing for 77 minutes. He's mm -hmm. shooting babies. Yeah. Uh, there was this baby wailing he screamed at the parents to shut the baby up. When the baby kept crying, I, I think he shot it right in the back. Mm -hmm. So these are stories that stay with me. Uh, there was a kid running out of the McDonald's, stumbling, that will forever haunt me. Mm -hmm. Bicycles on the, f on the street um, because kids were shot while they were on their bike. Uh, the crime scenes are very emotional and haunting, like the bowling alley massacre. Right. Um, well, just, uh Yesterday, here in the United States, in Michigan, a man just randomly went through the community shooting people, killed a number of people, including a 14-year-old girl. Does that get into the debate of guns and regulations of guns or the lack of regulations of guns? Oh, Mexico sit, was swamped I mean, with we, these military-style weapons. We could sit, here for, we could sit here forever and talk about that. And you know, the NRA, they're not going to back down. And right. there's always going to be, I mean, it's just too much money involved. But, but it's going to have to take just a, like an incredible incident in a bad way or someone, let's say, walks into a, a stadium full of 50,000 people and just blows it away. Right. Because if Sandy Hook didn't do it, what will, Leon? Right. Well, but if that, that doesn't do it, what will? 
and it's hard to know what works when it comes to dealing with people with guns. But we do know that many of the guns that went into Mexico came from the United States into Mexico, military style weapons, the AK-47s and so on. The drugs are coming this way, guns going that way. Well, everyone knows about Operation Fast and Furious. I mean, well, I shouldn't say everyone knows about it, but it was the biggest scandal in the White House since Watergate. Yeah, that even the federal government got into letting some go in to try to track who was getting them and who and was And they lost them. that trace. Yeah, right. And then, and then they, they killed the U.S. Border Patrol you agent. You could do a movie on that. Call it Fast and Furious? <laughs> yeah, I don't think... Uh, Mr. Holder and Mr. Obama would take part in that. No, they wouldn't. You, no. you don't think they'd let you in for an interview? I don't know. I mean, I just think that's a sore spot with them. Right. Well, we don't want to spend all the time on speculation. You, you're still a realist trying to find what is real. Well, I fight for people. I mean, I, I think there's so much unfairness in the world. Um, I'm a fighter. Mm -hmm. I'm not always going to win, but if I lose, I'm going to go down fighting. Okay. Well, you got a good pair of gut boxing gloves because you've got uh, visual. You can pull up things, you can find things, you can talk to people, you mm -hmm. can get their impressions, and and part of, you have great editors evidently that help you put all this together. Incredible, and one of them is with us this weekend. I flew him in from New York, uh -huh. uh, flew my assistant in from Phoenix, uh, my other cameraman from San Diego. It's the right thing to do, because they've, uh, filmmaking is a collaboration, right. and I need to reward my crew. Right. A very brave crew. Oh, what? you have to be brave to run around with you, Charlie. Well, Leon, I'm, telling, I'm talking about excessive guts. I'm talking <laughs> mind-bending guts. Yeah. There's guts, and then there's mind-bending guts. Because this man, when anybody, and I've known people that worked with journalists that went missing in Mexico, and photojournalists that were killed in Mexico. You know, you've been to El Dario. You've interviewed people with El Dario. El Diario, yeah. El Diario. Yeah. You know some of these things that are happening. The Mexican and, journalists are my heroes. They don't get paid a lot of money. They do not get paid a lot of money, but yet they go out there and they get information for the curious public. Right. And they're putting their lives on the line. They're like literally in the middle of the gunfire. And some that are from here that have gone into Mexico to write stories and right. their lives are in danger. Absolutely. Uh, they get the threats. Well, Charlie, any last words before our time runs completely up? Well, you Mexico's Bravest Man is uh, playing now at Bassett. And give us a number. Mexico's Bravest Man dot com is the website. And okay. it's playing at Bassett. Okay. It's got six show times a day. And the trailer could be viewed on Mexico's Bravest Man dot com. Okay. It's a very significant story because this man helped lower the murder rate eighty percent in Juarez between eleven and thirteen. Whether he fought crime with crime, I'll let the audience decide that after watching and hearing all the tough questions. Uh, the film is balanced and fair. All the tough questions are asked. I, 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 pre I appreciate the work you do. Well, thank you, Leon. And all that you put into well, this, yeah. it takes a great deal of energy and effort and time to do that. Well, thank you. Give my regards to your assistance. Stay tuned. We may have Charlie Min back again in the future to talk about his other adventures. I'm Leon Blevins, El Paso Community College.